Okay, go. Okay, we're interested in the book of Romans now from the standpoint, and I guess you could say this is even more introductory matters, but it would even have to do with any of the letters written in the New Testament. And uh, they, they had literary styles, even as people do today who write. Um, and I don't think that we can really understand the message of any one letter um, unless we can understand the circumstances and the situation of the times which caused the letter to be written. Uh, you think about it, in a time when communication between two people was either verbal or in writing, and that was it. Thus, uh, people express themselves in their writing, and many letters were quite lengthy. And keep in mind, these letters that make up the New Testament are just that, they're letters. Now, it's true, the inspired of God, they make up the New Testament of Jesus Christ. It's the will of Christ, sets forth the way of salvation, and no other book does. Nevertheless, the way God chose to reveal his message was in these, these letters. And uh, what we find is that we, when we write something, even if it's um, an email to somebody or from one department to another in a company, there's a reason that we have to write it. Uh, may be a frivolous reason, may not be frivolous. And um, so they had a reason for writing each writer did, and we should try to understand what is he saying and why is he saying it at this time? And that means a great deal, and I would suggest that's a general uh, principle behind studying any one letter. When you look at the letters uh, of the New Testament, and of course they would write those pretty much like anybody at that time in their culture and society would write letters to one another, they followed, the inspired writers at least did, we'll qualify it in that way, basic form, and it's typical of not only the letters that make up the New Testament, but as I said earlier, typical of just about the way any letter was written. Uh, we know that because there's lots of letters out there that have come down to us. And um, when you study the writings of the so-called church fathers, or when you find letters that were written between different people who had nothing to do with Christianity, they all tended to follow the same pattern. Usually there would be a greeting in Romans, that's Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. <clears throat> then there's some kind of a petition or prayer, as it is in Romans 1 and verse 7, and then thanksgiving is expressed, and that's done in Romans 1, verse 8. And then you have a part of the letter, once that's done, that we would call maybe special contents, and that usually is the main body of the letter. And it gets in definitively into what they wrote and the why they wrote it. It'll let you know a lot about what's going on. And there may be more than one reason for writing it, and you're usually going to run into it in this part of the letter. And then um, there's uh, special salutations, and there's personal greetings. And if you look at each one of the letters, there's pretty much that pattern followed by each one of the inspired writers. Um, I would suggest that there, that you read the letter, and in this case, Romans, through at one sitting. Uh, we don't tend to do that, but I think you'll find that the way our minds work and God intended the people that read it to understand it, that when these letters were originally written, they were written to be read before the whole congregation there would be people in the churches who could not read. And uh, thus, they depended uh, tremendously on their ability to listen to what was said 
Thus, uh, there's a flow, if you'll read it, realizing there were no chapters and verses when these things were written. If you'll read it through, then it'll make a difference is just get the flow of the letter. Remember, Paul dictated this letter to Tertius. I believe that's right. And um, <clears throat> thus it was given in a flow as if in preaching. I found a long time ago, I don't know how far back, very young person when I started, that if you get up and read one of these letters out loud, any, any one of them, especially Paul's letters, if you read them out loud and, and read it as if you're saying this to people, you want them to hear what you're saying. You're like preaching a sermon or teaching a class. It's amazing how, how things come together just by giving the, uh, noticing the markings, the comma, the semicolon, the periods, whatever. Um, there's another thing that you may or may not know. When the King James translators uh, put together what we now know as the King James Version, 1611, they were determined to make it flow in a way that would sound well to those in the congregation hearing it read. Because again, there were a lot of people that didn't read well, or there were people that just did not um, read at all. And they did a lot more public reading and lengthy public reading at that time. And um, so the, King James translators worked hard on making the English flow. And I suggest that um, you read it out loud. And also just have you be a better reader. You know, there's just not much reading done at all nowadays and certainly not anything done out loud. And uh, you might try that. I found that to be helpful to me in just understanding what a passage says just by reading it out loud and putting the emphasis into it. I think probably, I don't believe I'm extending this too much or shortening it too much. When I say the average reader can read through the epistle to the Romans in about an hour, maybe less, according to how good a reader you are. There are several things about the book you might find interesting. Uh, Paul uses in the book of Romans more Old Testament quotations than he does in all of his other writings. And another interesting fact is uh, what we have is chapter 12. If you read a lot of commentaries or look up things on the book of Romans, you may find it called the, quote, golden chapter of the Bible. And it is said, and if you will read it and take note of it, that next to the Sermon on the Mount, as we know, our Lord's sermon. It offers the best summary of the Christian's duty to God and man that you're going to find as far as uh, something other than what the Lord did. Realizing that Paul was always being challenged by the Judaizing teachers in the church, he also dealt with the unbelieving Jews, but those that really could disturb his work would be the Judaizing teachers in the church. Thus, when you read through the book of Romans and the book of Galatians, you'll see that they're both similar in that they set out the gospel system of salvation through an obedient faith apart from the law of Moses. And you must remember the Judaizing teacher said, yes, you uncircumcised Gentiles are going to be saved if you're circumcised, keep the law. And they were mainly interested in getting them to be circumcised. They, they, they didn't care too much whether the Gentile kept everything about the law, but they would not give that up. And thus they wanted to discredit Paul as an apostle of Christ. And all you have to do is read Galatians 1 in particular is, any one chapter out of these two books of Romans and Galatians to see exactly how the Holy Spirit thought about the matter through the pen of Paul to the church of Galatia on the matter of uh, another gospel, the Greek, another, the two words in Greek for another. One means another of the same kind and one means another of a different kind. 
the Greek would have had no trouble when you said another to know whether you meant the same kind or a different kind because he would use the appropriate word. And uh, when you've got another gospel mentioning Galatians 1, then it's a, another gospel of a different kind than Paul preached to them. And that's basically said by Paul. Uh, in the final chapter of Romans, it's interesting. I don't know if anybody's ever taken time to count them, but there's, there's some um, uh, 28 personal greetings that Paul makes to Christian friends. And that's more than he does in any of his letters. I don't know the reason for all of that. Don't know why to figure it out, uh, but he did. Also interesting that he had that many people who were there in the church at Rome when he had never been there. But the letter also lets everybody know, I plan on coming through there. I want to impart to you some miraculous gift and I'll be coming through there, but, but not staying uh, uh, permanently, but I'll be going through Rome and as I tend to go to Spain. I, you might find it interesting. I may have said it before, but uh, there's even uh, uh, rumor, and that's all you can say, you can't prove it, that Paul even got into the uh, uh, into England in his preaching. Uh, we don't know what he did after his first being released first. We don't know what he did in that time. But uh, I, I do know this about Paul. He would have gone there if he could. So obviously he had plans to go to Spain. He'd go to Spain, he'd go to anywhere else in the Roman Empire. And we definitely know that he wanted to go to Spain as he uh, spread the gospel. Um, it's, again, this is difficult for us to understand that the Jews of Jesus' day, of Paul's day, the first century, just could not see how that a Jew who was a descendant of Abraham, a circumcised son of Abraham, could be lost. That was all that was needed. Uh, you can see that attitude presented by Nicodemus when the Lord taught about the new birth. And uh, I think it's entering, interesting that Josephus, who himself was a Jew, and was a part of the rebellion that finally led up to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and so forth. Uh, he was, he, he actually was a leader in Galilee. And he came out to negotiate with Vespasian and decided, I'm out of this mess and I'm going to switch sides. And he did. And one of the things that allowed him to write all that he did without having to earn a living, be concerned about such things as that, is that he predicted that Vespasian would be made Caesar, and lo and behold, he was, and Vespasian became his patron. That's the reason he could go back to Rome and write all he did about the Jews that you can read about in Josephus. But he made this comment about the Jews of Christ's time. By, I will say this too. At the siege of Jerusalem, after Vespasian had gone back to, to Rome to become Caesar, of course, Titus was there, and he would uh, beg from the Roman armies, crying out at the walls, uh, that is, Josephus crying out at the walls, begging them to give up, and that didn't put them in their good graces. But here's what he said about the Jews of that time. Quote, earthquake and lightning must have destroyed them, that's the Jews, if the Romans had not done so. And remember, the Lord called them stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Stephen called them that. And you know what they did to Stephen. And you know what they did to Christ. And you know what they tried to do to, to uh, Paul. So they were not open to reason. They were not open to adequate evidence, credible witnesses. They just would not believe that they needed anything like the gospel of Christ. Well, those are, to me are some interesting things. Um, I would like to get into a summer, summary of, of the book that gives emphasis to important points. In uh, the letter of the Romans, the religious history of man 
is actually mentioned and classified under four headings. I'll give these headings and we'll go back and talk about them for a minute as they relate to the whole Bible, the unfolding of the scheme of redemption down through the stream of time. You have, first of all, Paul talking to the church at Rome. Now understand, he, uh, he knew that this letter would be circulated. He knew as an apostle of Christ that this would be one of the letters making up the New Testament of Christ. He knew it would be read down through the ages and even as we're studying it now. So he deals, first of all, with the sin of Adam. Once you see uh, that he says the Gentile sin, the Jews were given a law and they didn't keep it. So in Romans 3.23, he concludes all under sin. And then he begins to talk about sin. So he talks about how sin entered the world through Adam's personal sin. And that sin passed upon all men, not as Calvin says, by having inherited Adam's original sin. But he says, because all have sinned. But Adam opened the doorway for it by his own personal sin. And thus all have sinned and come to the glory of God. So there's the first thing he deals with. And I suggest to you that if you're going to see someone really converted, they're going to have to understand what sin is. They're going to have to understand the heinousness of sin, and that's the only thing that stands between them and God. The only thing that can keep them out of heaven is to die with their sins unforgiven. They're going to have to recognize how terrible sin is in God's sight. And then they're going to have to conclude, I am a sinner and lost as I am, and I'm responsible for that, and I can't blame it on anybody else. So you've got that dealt with in the first part of Romans. Then you've got the promise God made to Abraham. Of course, that was in Genesis 12 originally. And once he discusses that promise, which was revealed then and developed, of course, it was even vaguely revealed in Genesis 3, verse 15, that the way of salvation would come through the seed of woman. But following the sin of Adam first in the letter, and then the promises God made to Abraham all concerning our salvation, and then the third, if you want to call it, point in the outline is he deals with the law of Moses. What's the purpose of the law? What was the reason for the Jews? What did the law do? And then he bring, that brings us up to the next point, fourth point, and the last one, redemption is found only in Christ. It's not found in the law, but it's found in Christ. And so he develops it that way. Now, I said I wanted to make comment regarding these four points as to the revelation of God through the whole Bible concerning how he would save man from his sin. If you consider that uh, the Bible's made up of 66 books, and this will sound familiar to everybody, especially those that were in our class we had. And uh, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, and three great ages in which God dealt with man, the patriarchal age of the Father rule period, Genesis 1-1, the giving of the law through Moses on Mount Sinai to the Jews in Exodus 19 and 20. That was a period of some 2,500 years, and then approached God through no written law, but through the fathers who were the priests and so forth. Then under the law of Moses, you had the Jews set apart from all other nations, Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 5, and uh, they were under the law, and they approached God under the Levitic law. Then you have, of course, with the death of Christ, Colossians 2, 14, the law nailed the cross. Church began Acts 2, and Christ has all authority, and the New Testament expresses in its words, the authority of Christ. We're to do all by his authority, Colossians 3.17. And thus, uh, the New Testament now has the authority that we're to follow, for Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father, but by him, John 14.6. Now, I say all of that. From the beginning through the end of the revelation of God and the completion of the New Testament, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. You basically have all of that under these four headings that Paul wrote under in writing the letter to the church at Rome, the sin of Adam, the promise of Abraham, the law of Moses, and the redemption of Christ. And I think in that you have um, 
a good way to approach anybody that'll listen to you as to causing them to understand how God through Christ saves man from his sins. And that's the general history of man, I guess we'd say religious history, that's classified on those four headings, and you can see how that fits in to the whole of the Bible, being that it was given to man down through the years, and finally, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, Galatians 4, verse 4. We can give an analysis of uh, the letter to the Romans, and that'll help us systematize it in our own mind for remembering it. In chapters 1 through 5, you have actually the declaration of the teaching, of the doctrine. And one that's 1 through 5, chapters 1 through 5. There are some objections that are answered by Paul in chapter 6 through 8, 6 through 8. And then chapters 9 through 11, chapters 9 through 11, we see Israel's rejection, and there's a discussion of why Israel was rejected. In chapters 12 through 13, you have practical exhortations and Christian conduct. What do we mean by practical? We mean day-to-day -day Christian living, how you deal with yourself, your family, your people on the job, in the church, out of the church, the general attitude of the faithful child of God, and how he deals with people. And you will see two discussed in chapter 14, beginning in verse 1 all the way through chapter 15, and verse 13, Romans 14, 1 through 15, verse 13, uh, various, we might say mutual obligations of strong and weak, and he means they're in the faith, in their own individual faith in God, strong and weak Christians. Um, you'll run into some people sometimes say, well, this person's just weak in the faith, as if he's always going to be weak in the faith. When you read Romans 14 and he talks about people weak in the faith, he doesn't mean they're going to be weak forever. That's not expected. But he is saying there's a class of people in the church, maybe because they're babes in Christ, whatever the case, that due to the lack of time to study, they don't have the confidence and strength coming from the Word of God that they need, and the faithful, strong people in the faith must take them into consideration. But don't let somebody say that, well, you're weak in the faith, or so and so is weak in the faith, or somebody's weak in the faith in the church, and they're always going to be weak in the faith. God expects people who are weak in the faith to grow, to develop, and not be weak always. So that's an important point to keep in, in mind about that. But for those that are strong in the faith, then he teaches in Romans 14 1 how they are to deal with those who are weak in the faith. Now keep in mind, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And if you're weak in the faith, that usually ties in with a lack of proper knowledge of the New Testament because faith cannot exist where proper knowledge of the Bible, that is a proper faith, a correct faith, an acceptable faith, cannot exist where people don't understand the Bible correctly. Now you get over to the Hebrews epistle, and he rebukes those brethren because he says, you haven't used your time like God intended, and you should have used it because you haven't exercised your mind to discern good from evil. So you've lost what you had, and therefore you have need of being taught again the first principles of the oracles of God. Uh, you're not able to take meat and chew it. You're like a baby. You can only drink milk. So... It is true that there are people like that, and in Romans 14, he talks about them being weak in the faith. They don't understand the Bible like they need to, but he expects them to grow, and if nothing else, from what he said to the Hebrew brethren, they didn't use their time to grow in greater knowledge and practice of the truth and in discerning uh, things in the light of the Word of God, which also tells us that's how you use the Word of God. You learn to measure things as to whether it's right or wrong on the basis of whether the Bible authorizes it or it's expressly just so many words forbidden. And if you're not used to doing that, then things can certainly get by you.
And so there is a mutual obligation of the faithful, of the strong in faith, of the weak in faith, but the weak in faith are to stay weak. They're expected to grow and become strong. And we have to have time to do that. So we have to use our time properly in learning and in practicing and in exercising our minds in the use of those things. Chapter 15, chapter 15 of Romans, verses 14 through 33, you'll see that Paul gives his own personal notes and plans. I don't know why he thought they would need that, but no doubt it had to do with his plans to go through Rome and impart some miraculous gift to them, be able to teach and edify them as he was on his way to Spain. So he gave those particular matters of his, of his uh, plans and his uh, personal thinking at that time. And then in chapter 16, he deals with the uh, personal uh, greetings, two different ones that he knew. I want to look a little bit more at chapters 9 through 11 before we leave it. I think it's deserving of some more comments. You'll remember that Paul had affirmed that the gospel was not an innovation, but it was the fulfillment of the Old Testament system and the promises God made to Abraham, but not only to Abraham, he made them to Isaac and Jacob. He made them to David. He made them to the prophets. And his readers could have wondered, these members of the church at Rome and anybody else that would read the letter, study it, even us today, his readers might wonder if that promise had really been kept. They might wonder also why had the Jews generally not recognized the claim and accepted Jesus and the New Testament? They could have asked the question, did their rejection of the gospel reveal a flaw in Paul's reasoning? Now, I think, personally, he's anticipating what Judaizing teachers might say and thus in the letter, because think how those letters had to travel and how long that they might need to go back and consult that letter a number of times to make sure they understood what Paul said, just like we have to study the Bible time and time again, and we never stop. But I think he's anticipating the Judaizing teachers' uh, efforts to counteract what he would say in that letter. The, Paul responded that it was, and this is something a Calvinist won't understand, who thinks that God ordained, predestined back in eternity, who would be saved, and they have no choice in the matter, or who would be lost, they have no choice in the matter. That's their concept of a sovereign God. But they, the, the, when he responds, that is when Paul responds, that he needed to emphasize that because God is God and all that implies. It is therefore the prerogative of God to do with Israel and the Gentile nations as he wished to do. That's where the idea of the potter and the clay comes in. God had every right to choose the Gentiles when in the stream of time he chose to do so. That is the fullness of time. The Israelites tended to forget that in the fullness of time, God chose them. Now, were they going to question God and why he chose the time that he did to choose them for the purposes that he had in Israel? Remember, time is nothing to God. A thousand years says a day, and day is a thousand years. But when God created time and created man as man is made, then in working with man, he has to work with man in the time and in the way he made man. 
So with us, it's 2,000 years ago. With God, it's not. He's not governed by time like we are. And that's an amazing thing maybe to people, but we need to remind ourselves he's not a man. He doesn't operate like we do at all. He doesn't exist as we exist. We begin and end our sojourn on earth. Our spirits continue on eternity, but God's the father of our spirits. But God has no beginning or ending. He created all things. So as he chose the Gentiles, so he chose Israel in the proper time in this world. Paul insists in his writing that God's present rejection at that time of Israel was not some, uh, some capricious thing. Israel deserved to be rejected. Israel was self-righteous. If you want to see how Israel was, look at the Lord's dealing with them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, does that mean every single solitary Israelite was that way? Well, no. But it means as a race of people, they were to a great extent. And uh, his, God's refusal to accept what uh, Israel, or God's refusal to accept Israel because she rejected, rejected the gospel was his prerogative. If people reject the gospel today, whether they're 20 years old or 80 years old or anywhere in between or older, then you're rejected of God. But does that make any difference how old you are, male or female? A child who's accountable to God for his actions or somebody much older. We are responsible for our conduct before God. And if we receive the gospel in humility and obedience, he accepts us. That's exactly what Peter said he finally had dawned on him. And look what it took to get Peter to understand it. And he said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. So Paul is still dealing with that in the first century. And since these people were Gentiles and Jews, then he had to find, uh, uh, make sure that they would understand that very point about God acceptance and how he accepts people and God's rejection and how he rejected people. I said this a moment ago, but um, Israel's rejection wasn't total. There were those, if nothing else, the apostles proved this, who would believe the gospel, who would follow Christ. Any Jew may receive salvation just as any Gentile may receive salvation. How is that? By believing Jesus Christ to be the Messiah with an obedient, living, active faith. Is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5, 9. Now, as you move along, more and more Gentiles were heeding the gospel, believing it, and obeying it, therefore becoming citizens of the kingdom of God, than were Jews. Some people not having a knowledge as they ought to have wondered why God was rejecting Israel. Well, I've touched on this already several times, but let's, let's enumerate and see if that helps us understand even better. First of all, acceptable worship does not depend upon one's fleshly descent. Read Romans chapter 4. Paul deals with that. Justification by an obedient faith, that faith being in Christ, faith comes from hearing the word of God, that's faith in Christ, Romans 10, verse 17, is just as much available to the Jew as it is to the Gentile. Now look at chapter 5. Chapter 5, he makes that very clear. When you hear these premillennialists still try to extol the Jew today as having a special relationship with God simply because they're fleshly descendants of Abraham. 
then do you think they really understand the book of Romans? Do they really understand the nature of the kingdom? Do they understand the church is the kingdom, the kingdom is the church? No, they don't have any idea about that. The Jews as individuals were not and are not being rejected. But when they reject the gospel, just like the Gentile who rejects the gospel, then they have rejected God's only offer of pardon. There is no other. Now, go and read chapter 10, and you will see that Paul deals with that. So you have then in chapter 4, except the worship does not depend upon the flesh. Then in chapter 5, justification is in Christ through the gospel and faithful Christian living. And then God did not reject all Jews. He rejected the individual Jew who would not believe the gospel or the individual Gentile who would not believe the gospel. Let me just say that God's rejection of Israel was not maybe as terrible as it may seem upon first considering this. And I've already mentioned this too. A remnant of the Jews did accept and serve Jesus. Where did the apostles come from? Who were the 120 there on the day uh, that the church started? Who were those who heard and believed and obeyed the gospel and cried out, first of all, after being persuaded Christ is the Messiah? And then, brethren, what shall we do? Because they've been pricked in the heart by the gospel. These were all Jews or proselytes. Never in the history of the nation, and this is important to remember, never in the history of the Jewish people had any but a remnant been faithful. The majority had not been faithful. When you look into the wandering Jews in the wilderness, what happened to all the Jews 20 years old and upward in the wilderness except for Caleb and Joshua? They all died. So when you take the whole nation of Israel at any one time, only a few, in contrast to the whole nation, had ever served God like they ought to have served him. And there came a time then when everything got so bad that he brought along the Assyrians to destroy the 10 northern tribes. And then he brought along the Babylonians to destroy the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin, primarily Judah, since it was the biggest of the two tribes. So they never had been what they should have been. And Paul deals with that in Romans chapter 2. You can almost see the Jews in the congregation when he's in Romans 1 showing how the Gentiles desire not to retain God in their knowledge and God that gave them up to do all these things and he gives a list of how terrible they were. You can almost see them saying, yeah, well, yeah, back then though, we had the law of Moses and we were what we ought to be. But then all of a sudden, chapter 3 turns around and said, well, what about you Jews? You were given the law of Moses. Did you keep it? Did all of you really keep it? No. And if you go back to Acts 15 that we studied not long ago, Peter said that the law of Moses was a yoke placed on our necks that neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. So they recognize that, and we're able to see then that they needed to know all were under sin. Whether you were a Jew or whether you were a Gentile, you all needed Jesus Christ, and without Jesus Christ and his God's in obedience to it, individually you'll be rejected. But you won't be rejected on the basis of flesh. You'll be rejected on your own individual responsibility to God and accountability to God to obey the truth. So there was never but a remnant of Israel that was faithful to God. And I said earlier that they were a very self-righteous crowd. Did that only happen at the time Jesus was on the earth and the early church started? Oh, go look, look at, um, at Jonah. Just read, look at Jonah's attitude. If I go preach those Ninevites and they repent, what's God going to do? He's going to forgive them. I don't want to preach to them. They may repent. So he had that, and it seems to me we should recognize that Jews had had Jonah all that time, didn't get the main message out of it which was God loves everybody. 
and that really sin is the only thing that separates Jew and Gentile from God, and Christ the only one that has the answer to solving that problem. Christ has the answer or the solution to the sin problem, and he's the only one that does. And thus he would say to the Jews, John 8, verse, I believe, 24, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. It's pretty plain language. So Israel's rejection as a chosen nation, when they had fulfilled their purpose, allowed the Gentiles really better opportunities than before to learn of God. Now watch him develop that idea. We can't study it right now, but as you read through Romans, think about it. You'll see he makes that clear. It also says now if that worked for you, then if, you don't, if you're not faithful, then he can deal with you and will deal with you the same way he dealt with Israel. The wide spread, and it was, especially after AD 70, but it was already beginning in AD 50 and 60, conversion of the Gentiles worked against the hardened Jew. It just made him harder and more jealous. But, of course, there would still be some who would believe the truth. So what we're learning here is that we establish the fact that no group of people or no fleshly DNA-related people are going to be saved. But each individual, according to his own disposition of heart, toward the Word of God, the gospel system, and his obedience to it, is going to be saved. As James says, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Any Jew who truly wants to be saved, or anybody else, of course, can do so by believing in Christ based upon the truth of God's word and obeying him based upon his faith. Faith comes from hearing the word of God exactly as the Gentiles could or vice versa. So that's an important point, I think, that we ought to keep in mind, and that's the reason I want to talk about uh, chapters 9 through 11, because Paul spends a lot of time there, and he does some pretty deep reasoning along that line, and I wanted to mention that at this stage. Well, we we'll, won't run it down to 8.25 or 8.20 tonight. We've hit a good stopping point, and I think we'll just stop here. It's almost 8.15, so if you've got any questions, if you write down anything, you want to deal with later, just let me know. So uh, 